But the morning that he left, just before dawn, he saw a total lunar eclipse that was not on any of the almanacs. It was not predicted. Another bad omen. This attempt at settling at the end of the world was nothing but a disaster. So here I am, stuck. My motor's just seized. Stuck in the middle of nowhere. And the skeleton that you talk about, what was it? No, it's a secret. I was up literally at the crack of dawn. It looked like I was in luck. Sunny day and everything at this hour was bathed in a beautiful golden light like Jose's handmade witch and, and little wooden boat. It looked like it was going to be a perfect sunny day. But I soon found out appearances can be deceptive. Yep, that's ice. Ice. Ooh, freezing. Ice. Ice. Ugh. Los los tornados en la el mar. Ah, los los canales para arriba, tipo. Son muy fuertes estos remolinos, esos tornados. No puede dar vuelta. Ya la pille. Tornados se saca agua del mar. ¿Y cuántas veces has visto eso? ¿Muchas veces? Tuve una parte, una, como, como un mes tuvimos. Todos los días se habían tornado. ¿En, en, ¿En qué meses? En el mes de, de diciembre. Ahora no. Mucho tiempo no. ¿Hay, hay accidentes por estos tornados? Sí, o sea, nos echamos cúteres a pique, embarcaciones de 10 metros. Y, y la historia sobre el paraguayo, ¿qué, qué haces con él? ¿Qué caminante por Cabo Fraua? Ah, paraguayo se pasó por acá no más, pero después ya no lo vi más. Paró la sala. ¿Se murió, probablemente? Pate a la ocha, como dice. Pero se murió él. ¿Nunca encontró el, el cuerpo o no? Los documentos. Documentos solo. Uh, y y eso fue, fue hace muchos años, ¿sí? Era su 15 años. Señor Jose told me off camera a rather intriguing story. That someone found a skull and uh, it had some letters engraved in the teeth of the skull that he thought was a word in English and it could have been some sort of pirate or castaway, of which there are many stories in this Strait of Magellan. But when I asked him on camera, he didn't want to repeat it. <laughs> y, y el esqueleto que, que tú hablas, tení, ¿qué fue? Ah, no, es, es un secreto. Un secreto. Es un secreto. Bidding Senor Jose farewell, I decided to head south just to see how far south I could go on the bike and start going north again. The real beginning of my trip as I saw it. But I didn't get very far, maybe a mile or two, before I came to this. A huge water hole that looked really deep. Well, this is as far south as I'm coming. Uh, I've got a problem with my, my glasses fogging up, but... The road down there is full of water holes, so I can't see how deep they are, so I'm not going to go through them. But this is as far south as I'm going. It's a beautiful view, a beautiful day. Just look at that. The Straits of Magellan. I'm as far south here as Newfoundland, Earl Island, is north. There's only one way now, north. I feel like my journey's really beginning now, on this little dirt track down here in Patagonia. So, I'm off. Off with Atlake.
here amongst the water birds in the Straits of Magellan. I came to visit this. This is a monument to Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, who, if you know your Inca history, wrote a lot about the Incas, but he also was down here uh, founding a colony for the Spanish in around about 1584. The Spanish wanted to uh, control this part of the world, colonize it. So, uh, yeah. That sign says, the 25th of March, 1584, representing King Philip II of Spain, the captain of the strait, Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, founded in this spot the town of Rey Felipe, Rey meaning king. Sarmiento was born in Spain, entered the military, fought in a few wars there, then sailed for Mexico, where he spent a few years, but there he fell foul of the Spanish Inquisition, probably because he was a Renaissance man, a man who questioned things. In any case, he soon set sail for Peru, where he again fell foul of the Inquisition, who accused him of owning a type of magic ink that if you wrote a love letter with it, the woman who received the letter would fall in love with you. He was also accused of owning a couple of magic rings, but he was well connected enough and respected enough to escape the torture chamber and any serious punishment. While he was in Peru, he heard stories of an Inca emperor called Tupac Yupanqui. Now Tupac Yupanqui, his father built Machu Picchu and he carried on conquests to the south and to the north of Peru, conquering what is today Ecuador. And from there he allegedly sailed for up to a year in a roundabout route that, that visited the islands Ahuachumbi and Nina Chumbi, today thought to represent the French Polynesian Marquesas Islands and Easter Island. He's said to have brought back dark-skinned people, the jaw of a horse, and some gold. This fantastic voyage is not very well known outside of Peru, but it's taught in schools in Peru. And there is some scientific evidence, including DNA evidence, that this voyage did actually take place. The DNA admixture has been dated roughly to the Tupac Yupanqui era. And if you remember the previous episode, a Spanish adventurer called Vital Alsar himself demonstrated not once but twice that it was possible to sail from Ecuador to Australia in a rudimentary balsa log raft. More on that in a later episode. But back to Sarmiento. He was intrigued enough by the tales of gold and black-skinned people that could be slaves that he convinced the governor to mount an expedition of exploration with two ships to look for these two islands. It was the year 1567, several decades after the initial conquest of the Incas. The easy pickings of looting Inca gold had started to run dry. Sarmiento's plan was to sail west along the Tropic of Capricorn, and if the three ships had kept to this course, they would have eventually hit the coast of Queensland. The expedition was headed by the nephew of the governor of Peru, and it is known that many troublemakers and dreamers joined this expedition, and there were soon divisions between the captains of the three ships. Two of them wanted to go north, and there was a big falling out. En route, they did discover the Solomon Islands, where they claimed to have seen cannibals. Eventually, the fleet returned via California, Mexico to Lima. In Mexico, Alvaro de Mendaña abandoned Sarmiento, and threw all his maps and papers overboard. A trial was later held in Lima, where Sarmiento defended himself and gained recognition for his discoveries. As a side note, Alvaro de Mendaña launched another expedition in 1595, leaving Callao, reaching the Marquesas Islands, and eventually reaching the Santa Cruz Islands. But one of the two main flagships, the Santa Isabel, disappeared. And about 120 years ago, there was a popular theory that that boat may have ended up in Australia. Now I'm getting a bit off track here, but there's a connection between this alleged voyage and Lawrence Hargrave, the man on the old Australian $20 bill. He's famous for inventing box kites and a revolutionary rotary radial aviation engine and a trimarine wing design that the Wright brothers used in their record-breaking flight. But he also spent a large amount of his time investigating a theory he concocted, trying to prove that the Santa Isabel came to Sydney, based mainly on some rock carvings that looked like Spanish ship outlines above where Bondi sewerage outfalls now stands. That theory was criticised in his lifetime, and it's now thought that the Santa Isabel did actually make it to the Santa Cruz Islands. 
Anyhow, getting back to Sarmiento de Gamboa. Back in Peru, Sarmiento worked for the iron-fisted Spanish governor Francisco de Toledo, charged with something more academic, writing an authentic history of the Incas. It was 1572, and he called together all the surviving conquistadors and Inca nobles and wise men. Some of them were up to 80 years of age and organized a hearing where they discussed the true history of the Incas. And when it was written down, it was read back chapter by chapter and voted upon as to its authenticity. And still today, it's regarded as one of, if not the most important chronicles of the history of the Inca Empire. On Friday the 13th of February 1579, a ship arrived in Callao, the port of Lima. On board was Sir Francis Drake. The ship was the Golden Hind, and using an element of surprise, he had been pillaging the west coast of South America and continued to do so after pillaging Callao. And off the coast of Ecuador, he captured a fantastically rich Spanish galleon. The Spanish ship was so full of treasure, it took six days to offload it, including 26 metric tons of silver, roughly estimated in today's prices to be worth $500 million. The Spanish governor, Toledo, put Sarmiento in charge of two ships who chased him north, trying to recapture the valuable gold, but to no avail. Sir Francis Drake disappeared westward, eventually returning to England via Asia and Africa. The Spanish knew that Drake had come from the south, had rounded Cape Horn, and they were afraid, with good reason, that the British might be setting up a base there to start naval operations. So they sent Sarmiento down with two ships to explore, survey and map the area with a view to a possible fortification and colonisation. Exploring the area in the southern summer of January-February of the year 1580, he experienced an eclipse often seen as a bad omen. But he went ahead and claimed the area for the King of Spain. But then exactly one week later, another bad omen came that he explains in his diary. During this night, at one o'clock, to the south-southeast, we saw a circular red meteor-like flame in the shape of a dagger which rose and ascended in the heavens. Over a high mountain, it became prolonged and appeared like a lance, turning to a crescent shape between red and white. Undeterred by these bad omens in the sky, Samiento returned to Spain, bearing detailed maps that indicated the strategic importance of the strait. The Spanish crown approved uh, colonization and fortification of the strait to reduce piracy and a fleet of 23 ships and two and a half thousand people left in September 1581 planning to colonize the strait but just a few days out of port they ran into a terrible storm four ships sank and they had to return undeterred Sarmiento regrouped the fleet and two months later 16 ships set sail but it was also to be hit with disaster. After wintering in Rio de Janeiro, three ships were lost en route to Rio de la Plata, today's Buenos Aires, and another three were sent back to Spain because of the poor condition of the ships. Three other ships stayed in Rio de la Plata, delivering a governor and new supplies that were to travel overland to Chile. Eventually, the five remaining ships entered the Strait of Magellan. They founded one town at the entrance to the strait and another one here where I am now with my motorbike, Ray Felipe. But the conditions were bad, morale was low, disease was rife, and there was a kind of mutiny. The three ships abandoned the colonies in the middle of the night and sailed back to Spain, leaving only two ships, only one of which was seaworthy. Sarmiento stumbled upon black coal and a whale graveyard that contained the bones of giant whales. These two industries, coal and whaling, would later become the mainstay of Punta Arenas. The Spanish settlers soon fell into conflict with the local natives and there were casualties on both sides. Initially they survived mainly on shellfish, which they found full of black pearls. They were so numerous, he mentions that they were a nuisance, having to spit them out all the time. Sarmiento then decided to take the one good ship and go back to the entrance of the strait to the other colony to fortify it. But the morning that he left, just before dawn, he saw a total lunar eclipse that was not on any of the almanacs. It was not predicted. Another bad omen. When he got to the entrance of the strait, his anchor cable broke and a storm that raged for 20 days blew him far out into the ocean and forced them to sail north to Brazil instead of back into the strait. When they finally arrived in Brazil, they were dying of starvation. Men were eating their sandals, 
Some had lost their fingers and toes, and he said they were blind from cold and hunger. Sarmiento actually sold his own clothes to buy food for the crew. Then disaster struck once again when his boat sank off the coast of Brazil, and he was lucky to survive. The Portuguese governor there felt sorry for him, resupplied him with a new ship and some more supplies, and he tried to go back to the Strait of Magellan, but a storm forced him back to port. Then he found trouble finding crew. Nobody wanted to go back to that tempestuous Strait of Magellan. So he decided to go back to Spain to resupply properly, and he boarded a Portuguese ship. But his bad luck continued. The Portuguese ship was captured by an English privateer owned by Sir Walter Raleigh, and he ended up a prisoner in England. But he was treated well there, and he even had an audience with Queen Elizabeth I. Eventually, he was allowed to return to Spain. But passing through France, he was arrested again and imprisoned for three years till the Spanish paid a ransom. Finally, he arrived back in Spain in the year 1590, six years after he'd left his settlement. In Spain, Sarmiento continued to plead the case for the abandoned settlers in the Strait of Magellan, but the king had more pressing problems and gave him a naval appointment and he died two years later, passed away at sea off the coast of Portugal in the service of the king. Sarmiento, the man who achieved so much in his lifetime, was unable to return to the bottom of the world and help the people he left there. Sarmiento left 337 people here, of which 13 were women and 10 were children. It's thought they nearly all died of starvation. That's why this cove is known as Puerto del Hambre, Port of Famine. There are only two known survivors. One was picked up in the strait in 1587, and the last known survivor, a single man, was found living here in this town of Felipe Rey in 1590. And you can only wonder whether those eclipses and strange lights in the sky were bad omens, because this attempt at settling at the end of the world was nothing but a disaster. About 50 metres down I could see the ocean and I could hear some activity going on, voices and a bit of banging and machinery. So I went down and had a look and it's a little fisherman's cove. This would have been where Sarmiento's boats would have anchored. You see that boat there that's beached? It's got a giant big hole in the back of it. I think it's abandoned. And over on the left here there's a couple of abandoned buses but I think they're sort of temporary huts for the fishermen to wade in for the tide or wait, wait for people to come and pick them up or whatever take them home you know who'd want to linger around in the open here in winter when it's like minus 20 <laughs> and a terrible you know chill factor wind blowing anyway i'm not going to linger here i've got to head north to argentina at wacky clocked over 8,000 kilometers just as i was crossing the rio de los siervos the the deer river just south of punta arenas but i didn't stop and bury a coin this time i just took a photo of the sign uh, because i was in a hurry to buy gasoline hit the road and get over the border so I didn't stop and take a photo of the odometer. But I did stop and take a photo of this jet fighter and this sign, which says there's a low chance of ice on the road. I hopped across the road, topped the bike up with gasoline and topped myself up with food, hot drink and a sandwich, ready to ride 240 kilometers north to the border with Argentina. It was a sunny day, I was doing about 60 or 70 kilometres an hour, went about an hour and a half north of Punta Arenas, the engine coughed, spluttered and then seized. It was all over in about five seconds. So here I am, stuck, my motor's just seized, I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere, 82 kilometres from Punta Arenas. She gave out on me. I was scratching my head, what could it be? Surely the engine hasn't seized. It's only done 8,000 kilometres. I had topped up the oil and it could hardly have overheated because despite the sunny aspect, it was cold and windy. Initially, I thought maybe the chain came off or something, but when I pulled the clutch in, the engine still wouldn't start. It was locked solid. I looked down the road and there was absolutely no traffic coming either way. Things aren't looking good for me and Atwaki. So much for making the border into Argentina today. Lifted it up, me and Miguel. Oh, my poor app, wacky. I never thought I'd see you like this. The damage was a lot worse than I expected. I don't envy people very often, but I envied him. Bon voyage.